Today is the day, the day we finally get some answers about what happened at Rolling Stone magazine with its rape on campus story. Columbia University has been investigating for months and its report comes out tonight at 8 p.m. But I've been digging around and I do have a preview of it coming up in just a moment. Now, the editors of Rolling Stone, let's be honest, they committed one of the worst journalistic sins in recent memory by publishing a shocking story about a gang rape at UVA that appears to have at least been partly made up. The police can find no evidence that the rape actually happened. But like I said, now we're finally going to hear what went wrong at Rolling Stone and we're going to hear from the story's author, Sabrina Rudin Erdely. This is what she said about her story back in November. This is before it started to be challenged. I met a young woman named Jackie. She's a junior now. And she told me that when she was a freshman, she was invited on a date to a fraternity house where there was a party. And while she was there, she was lured upstairs into a bedroom where she was gang raped by seven men, while two other men, including her date, uh, watched and gave encouragement. But Early never spoke to any of the alleged attackers. She said Jackie asked her not to. Now, once the story began to unravel, once people at CNN and the Washington Post and elsewhere started pointing out contradictions in it, and once Rolling Stone apologized for it and then called in Columbia to investigate, Erdely disappeared. She has been invisible ever since. But my sources say that she will break her silence tonight. She will be issuing a statement and formally apologizing for her errors. And Rolling Stone will be fessing up too. Columbia's investigation has concluded that there was a systemic failure at the magazine. In other words, Everybody was at fault. And my sources say the magazine will be taking down the discredited story from the web. So the story will be gone. Columbia's report will take its place. So are these the right steps and are they enough? Geneva Overholzer is exactly the right person to ask, a longtime editor and journalism professor who once served as the ombudsman for the Washington Post. Thanks for being here this morning. Great to be with you, Brian. There's a lot to unpack about what went wrong with this story, and maybe finally there's some closure coming with this report coming out tonight. Uh, you and I have not been able to see it yet. It's, it's being held under embargo by Columbia until 8 p.m. Exactly. Uh, but what do we need to know? What do we need to find out? Well, first of all, I think we can be very glad that it's an external review, unlike NBC with Brian Williams. The Rolling Stone went to Columbia and said, please do it. No holds barred. With so, NBC, they're doing this internal fact-checking of Brian Williams. Apparently, it's still going on, but they didn't bring outside investigators. Precisely. You're saying it was better for Rolling Stone to go bring in outsiders. A much more credible thing. Mm. So we'll see what Columbia thinks happened. Um, we'll see how well the Rolling Stone owns it. As I understand it, it's going to be published in both CJR, the Columbia Journalism Review, they're and in Rolling magazine, Stone. And in Rolling Stone magazine. So yeah. that's good. Yeah. Um, I think it will be very interesting to see if anyone um, sort of takes a hit. As you suggest, the staff was sort of all implicit. <laughs> right, so you mean are any editors, are any fact checkers going to lose their jobs or be disciplined? Yes, I wonder if anyone will, because this was really egregious uh, mm -hmm. journalism. There were all kinds of problems with it, as you suggest. Well, it starts with the writer, right? It starts with the writer, and, and some people have suggested she was trying to go out and find the most extreme case she could, the most extreme allegations. That can seem troubling on its face because uh, sometimes, you know, if you start out with the headline before you have the story, right. that can get you in trouble as a journalist. Absolutely, and that does seem to be what she did, although I think it's absolutely essential that we keep in mind that this is a terrible plague, really, um, sexual assault on the campus, and that right, this on campuses article, all across the country. Absolutely. Uh, some hundred campuses being investigated under mm -hmm. civil rights um, by the administration. So it's a very serious thing. And I think Rolling Stone thought, we've got this story, and it's a hell of a story, and it broke with great power. It did. In part because of the personal narrative. The personal narrative, though, with a not fully named individual and no corroboration from police, from friends, from witnesses, nothing. And one of the questions tonight is whether there was real deception on the part of that source. You know, it's so dangerous to get into that territory because it starts to sound like blaming the victim. But if she was not in fact a victim, if as the police say, they can't find evidence of the rape occurring, uh, then you have to ask why Rolling Stone's editors and fact checkers didn't do more to actually protect her. Absolutely. And this gets into this issue about sources. Is it our job as journalists to protect our sources by keeping them out of their own harm's way. Well, if it's an anonymous student 
who claims they were raped. Maybe it is our job to go the extra mile uh, and try to protect them from themselves. Do, do you know I what I mean? I think our primary job as journalists and the best way to protect our sources is to be sure we abide by our ethics. And one of the fundamental ethics is verifiability. It's really naming names that is the enforcer of truth. That's how the public mm. can figure out whether something's true. And so should we be granting anonymity to the most vulnerable in our society, which includes rape victims? Well, I hold a position on this, which is certainly not very common. But I have for 25 years, since the paper I edited won a Pulitzer um, with a woman who wanted to be named who had been raped. And that is mm. that while there has been a gentleman's agreement for many years that we won't name adults in only this one case of crime, right. this only is the this exception. crime, this yeah. is the exception, because we want to protect them for understandable reasons, a horrible crime, the worst sort of crime, violent, invasive in every way, mm. because we have wanted to protect them, we won't name names. I believe this has resulted in underreporting. Mm. It's robbed our reporting of credibility, and I think it led directly into what the Rolling Stone did. They did a completely unsourced, essentially, piece, mm. and the editor suspended their best journalistic judgment and said, we're going to go along with this, we're going to go along with Jackie's request that we not talk to the assailants, that it creates an unbelievable situation which fights the flames mm. of the people who say women are always making this stuff up. Right, this was a 9,000 word story in Rolling Stone. I'm told the report is 12,000 words, so it's even longer than really? the original report. We're going to learn a lot about what went wrong. I was speaking to a student there, Alex Pinkleton. We had her on the program here in December. She is a survivor of sexual assault at UVA, and she said her concern now is that people's impressions are still that when they, when they think about rape, they still think about the rape that Jackie alleged, which is a horrific gang rape over a course of hours, you know, uh, covered up by a university, seven people, as opposed to what's much more common, which is date rape, which is rape by an acquaintance, someone the person already knows, by one individual. Uh, right. She says there's still damage done, in other words, by this article. So what more can be done to fix that? Well, my view is that we should follow the lead of the very brave young women who are writing about their rapes. There's a piece in the Sunday Review in of the New York words. Times this morning, mm -hmm. in their own words, naming themselves, obviously, and that we in journalism should be at least as brave. I think the Rolling Stones' best move now would be to say we are not going to go along with this waving of journalistic ethics in which most journalists have been participating, we are going to ensure that we report on rape according to our best standards, which means we name names and we make sure that our reporting is credible. That is the way journalism will bring this to the public attention. It's the public that's got to solve the stigma mm -hmm. and this violence crimes prevalence. Geneva, thanks for being here and previewing it with us. Thanks I appreciate it.